morning with us. I bring to you greetings from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to those who are visiting with us perhaps for the first time. I say welcome. Uh, it is an honor to have you uh, worshiping with us this morning. And I pray that God will bless you uh, richly through his word. I uh, would ask that you keep uh, those on our prayer list in your prayer. Sister Legina Dunbar asked that you pray for her sister who was admitted into the hospital just a few days ago. She is doing better, but she is still in need of our prayers. Continue to pray for my mother who will undergo major surgery, so continue to pray for her that uh, the surgery will go well and that God will heal her body. Continue to pray for Sister Eartha McKinney and her family. Sister Eartha is asking for prayer for herself, her health, and the well-being of her family. Continue to keep Brother uh, Richard Lee in your prayers in the passing of his mother. Continue to pray for Randolph Jackson in the passing of his daughter. So we ask that you continue to keep all of them in your prayers. Continue to keep Urban Thomas, uh, Sister Katrina Hall in your prayers. Continue to keep uh, everyone who we keep on our prayer list. Continue to pray and lift their names up to God that God will hear our prayers and that he will grant them uh, the, the things that they stand in need of. So continue to keep them all in your prayers. Continue to keep this country in your prayers, our city, our communities. Uh, continue to pray for our young people uh, throughout this land. Church, I'm excited. I'm ready to worship God. I would also be remiss if I did not say Happy Father's Day to all of the men who are fathers here, uh, who, who, who are taking care of their children, who have raised children, perhaps even the stepfathers that, uh, that have, have taken on children uh, that aren't theirs biologically, but they raised them uh, to be uh, good and upstanding citizens in this, in this country. So happy Father's Day. I'm blessed that you are with us. I am ready to worship God and to hear what God has to say. And I pray that your hearts are open and receptive to the word of God. Let's worship God together. Sopranos, help me sing. I love you forever. Oh, Lord. 
to him under the oak and presented them. And the angel of God said to him, take the meat and the unleavened bread and lay them on this rock and pour out the broth. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord uh, put out the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened bread. And the fire sprang up from the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread. And then the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. And when Gideon saw that he was the angel of the Lord, he said, Alas, O Lord God, for now I have, been, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. The Lord said to him, Peace to you, do not fear, you shall not die. And then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and named it, The Lord is Peace. To this day, it is still in the Ophrah of the Abedzrites. I want to talk to you with this thought in mind. God is looking for a few good men. God is looking for a few good men. The book of Judges depicts the life and conduct of Israel after the death of their great leader Joshua. In Joshua chapter 24, he exhorted Israel to put away their idol gods, fear the Lord, and serve him. They were to choose for themselves whom they would serve, and Israel answered emphatically that they would serve Jehovah God. They even acknowledged that it was the Lord God who brought them out, up out of Egypt, who performed great signs in their sight, and that it was God who preserved them and protected them from their enemies, but still and still affirmed that it was the Lord whom they would follow and serve. The very words that they spoke would come to serve as a witness against them. The Bible declares that Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and the elders who knew the deeds of Jehovah. It was after the death of Joshua that Israel then inquired of the Lord as to who would go up first for them and who would fight against the Canaanites on their behalf. Oh, how soon they forgot that it was the Lord all along who went before them, that it was the Lord who protected and preserved them, that it was the Lord who cared for them and provided for them, and that it was the Jehovah God who saw better for their lives and who saw more in them that they saw in themselves. It was the Lord who would not allow evil or calamity to befall them and to overtake them. And it was this same Jehovah God who guided them at night and when they couldn't see and where they were going. It was Jehovah God who gave them purpose and empowered them to walk in purpose, to live in his favor. And it was the Lord God who made sure that his plan would not fail because they were carrying in their loins the Lord who the Messiah, the Christ, who would save the entire world. Never forget, my friends, where you come from. Never forget who it was that got you to this point in life. One of the main reasons Israel forgot God was because there was a new generation that did not know God or the deeds of God for which he had done in the previous generation. This thinking, this ignorance led to perilous and grievous sins against God. Their greatest sin next to unbelief was the sin of idolatry. And the results led them to being enslaved to their captors and sold into bondage. Ladies and gentlemen, whenever, wherever they went, the hand of the Lord was against them all because they chose not to obey the Lord. As you read this great book, the phrase 
And Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord is a redundant phrase that depicts the attitude and the thinking of Israel. It must be understood that our worship, dear friends, our worship greatly affects our walk. And the reason that's important is because Israel failed to take in account that who and what they worship would actually uh, serve to, uh, to, to, con to constrict and to, to control their walk. And the more they worshiped the idols of Egypt, the more they paid homage to the idols that were created, the further they walked away from God. Oftentimes, friends, it is not the enemy that is so powerful in our lives, but it is our unfaithfulness that gives power to our enemies that attack us. And sometimes, church, the enemy always isn't residing on the outside, but oftentimes the enemies are ourselves. You see, Israel failed to worship and honor God. They failed to demonstrate loyalty to God. And as a result, they were sold into bondage, sold into slavery. They were tormented by their enemies day and night. They, their crops were, 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 were made squander and spoil of their, their captives. And, and, and church, what Israel failed to understand time and time again was that it wasn't the Lord who had forsaken them, but it was their forsaking the Lord that allowed their enemies to overtake them. And sometimes, church, our worship is affected. Our wounds affect our worship. All because we have failed to respect God, failed to acknowledge God, we failed to worship and honor God, and as a result, God allows things to take place in our life. He allows the enemy to attack us so that we will wake up and recognize that it was God and God only that we needed to survive and to get along in this wicked world. Israel missed that point. Israel did not understand that their problem was a result of their, their persistent sinfulness and rebelliousness to God. That's the problem, church. Idol, idolatry is the problem. Unfaithfulness and unbelief, that's Israel's problem. And it really wasn't the enemies that were a problem and a threat to Israel. Israel had become a threat and an enemy toward themselves. All because they wouldn't worship God. Well, church, I need you to understand that if while we are all uh, guilty of self-inflicted wounds, while we are all guilty at some point in time or another of our own unfaithfulness to God and our own uh, uh, disbelief sometimes in God's power and God's working in our life, that we bring about calamity, we bring about hardship, that is really unwarranted and unnecessary all because we wouldn't listen to God, all because we wouldn't uh, 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 walk with God by faith. And sometimes those wounds will affect how we worship. But you need to be a child of God. You need to be a Christian who's made up in your mind that while you may not be perfect, while you may not have it all together, you refuse to allow your wounds to affect your worship. And while you worship, your wounds will be secondary to the God who's going to heal such wounds. Israel needed to learn this lesson and they needed to learn it fast. That God is not going to condone sin and unrighteousness, but God is rather ready and willing to reward faithfulness to his calling, faithfulness to his bidding, faithfulness to his purpose. God is more than willing, more than ready, and more than able to reward a people to uh, faithfulness. Well, 
Israel's uh, a physical problem at the time were a group of people called the Midianites. And the Midianites were a people, uh, you remember in Numbers chapter uh, 25, uh, they were, they were actually, when you go back to Genesis chapter 25, the Midianites were people who had come from the east, uh, from the river Jordan and Palestine. These Midianites were actually descendants of Abraham. You remember Abraham had married another woman by the name of Keturah. And through that, bore a child or bore children. And so Abraham, be, uh, with this union, brought forth the descendants called the Midianites. Now, the Midianites, during the leadership of Moses, were, uh, were opponents and they were antagonists to the people of Israel. As a matter of fact, they were, it, it was the Midianites and Moab who tried to get Balaam to put a curse on the Israelites. And you remember God reversed the curse. God wouldn't allow it to happen. And after failing in that attempt to put a curse on Israel, the Midianites would entice God's people by, act, by giving them their women. And, I, and the Israelite men would then marry and take on their women. And it would so corrupt and destroy the relationship that Israel had with God. And so God, in seeing the corruptness of the Midianites, seeing the contamination that it brought about with his people, he commanded Moses to destroy, to utterly destroy the Midianites uh, because of their sinfulness and because of their, 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 their antagonistic attitude toward God's people. Well, Moses did just that. When you read Numbers chapter 23 through 25, Moses utterly destroyed the Midianites. And it would be another 200 years later that the Midianites would be able to raise up again to fight and to antagonize the people of Israel. Let me pause here and let you know that when God expects us to put on a, a certain characteristic and when, he, and when he exhorts us to put to death certain things that would hinder our, uh, and impede our relationship with the Lord, you need to do like Moses. You need to utterly put it to death. God doesn't want certain things to linger in your life that's going to be an impediment, that's going to be a distraction in your life. When God says put it to death, God means utterly put it to death. That would be a good lesson to, for us to learn, dear friends, what Moses did. He obeyed the words of God and he utterly wiped out the Midianites and it took another 200 years, another 200 years before the Midianites would, would ever raise up and be relevant again. Well, what happens in our text is a problem because Israel has sinned against God over and over again. They refuse to listen to God. They refuse to follow God. And now they cry out to God. And when you read the book of Judges, what you also find is the graciousness and mercy of God. Because often Israel would, would fail to follow God. They would disobey God, reject God. They would worship the idols which would anger God. And then when God would, uh, would, uh, would allow their enemies to make squander of them, they would cry out to God. And then God would raise up a judge who would deliver them. And the Bible would, would say, when you read Judges, the Bible would say, whenever God raised up a judge to lead Israel, God was always with that judge. And when uh, and, and they would receive deliverance, they would actually experience prosperity, and the Bible would often say they experienced peace for a number of years. But right after they experienced peace, the text, the Bible would often say, judges would say, and the people did evil in the sight of the Lord. They've got a problem now. Their problem is evil, wickedness in themselves and in the Midianites. Now they have disobeyed God. We get to chapter 6, and here they are crying out to God. Here they are 
wondering who is going to deliver us now from the hands of the Midianites. Now, the Midianites had, had done Israel so bad that every so often, whenever the Israelites would bring, would plant and harvest, and when it was time, or when, it, when they would plant crops, and when it was time to reap the harvest of those crops, the Midianites would come in and make squander of their, and spoil of their crops. They would, they would put them in bondage. They would even put them to death. They would just come in and make waste of God's people and make waste of the food. They would take everything from the Israelites uh, without asking. They would come in and they would just be bullies to God's people. And so over and over this would happen and Israel would cry out to God, God, we need a deliverer. Who is going to deliver us from this turmoil that we are in. So the, the, the Midianites would, they would imprison God's people and they would impoverish God's people. And that's another good thought for us to ponder because whenever you walk away from God, whenever you walk outside of the purpose and will of God, sin will always impoverish you and it will definitely imprison you. Well, my men uh, who are listening today, here's the point to all of this. We need to know that God is searching for a few good men because the world that we live in is impoverished. The world that we are, are living in has been imprisoned by the devil. Our communities are imprisoned by the devil. Our children being imprisoned and impoverished by the devil. And God is searching for a few good men who would be willing to stand up for truth. A few good men who would be willing to say this is faithfulness to a marriage. A few good men who are willing to say I'm going to not only give life to a child but I'm going to actually be a father to a child. We need a few good men who are going to show our young people in the community there's more to selling dope and gang banging. We need a few good men who are going to be leaders in the Lord's church and in the Lord's kingdom who are going to say I don't have to necessarily bounce a basketball to be successful. I don't necessarily have to throw a football and, I, and, and to rap in order to be successful but God is looking for a few good men who would say I'd rather be a deacon than a rapper. I'd rather be a, a preacher than a dope dealer. I'd rather be an elder than, than to be someone uh, running women all over the place. God is looking for a few good men. Well, he gets to Gideon. Israel is in trouble. The, the Midianites have taken over, making waste of their, their crops after they labored and labored, after they given their, their time and their energy, their sweat, to make good crop, to make a living for their people. And here come the Midianites. And now they're cry, God's people are crying out. And here God is saying, let me find a good man. Well, I need you to know, dear friends, here's what we're going to look at as we peruse through this text. When God is seeking a good man, I need you to know that there must be a call to a good man. So what I want you to see is the call of Gideon, the commission of Gideon, and the confirmation of Gideon. There must be a call. God is calling all men, a few good men, willing to be courageous, willing to stand up for what's right, willing to abide by truth. God is calling a few good men. He calls Gideon while Gideon is in the wine press, while Gideon is out in the field doing work. Now notice verse number 11, the call of Gideon. The angel of the Lord came and sat on the oak, the oak which, was, which was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abizrite. As his son Gideon was beating out the wine press in order to save it from the Midianites. Now, one of the things I want you to pay attention to is that when God calls men to lead and to be leaders 
whether in the church or in the community, I need you to understand when God calls us, there will also be a confrontation. If you're going to be an effective leader, if you're going to be one who's in the number of those few good men, then you are going to be confronted with God, his will, and his purpose. You cannot lead people. You cannot lead the way God would have you to lead. You cannot be in this number of a few good men until you are first confronted with God, his purpose, and his will. I know that's right because in verse 12, it says, The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. Now, in the confrontation, he's confronted with the justice of God. He's confronted with the power of God. And he's confronted with the faithfulness of God. All of that is under, God, under the confrontation with God. Now, it is imperative that you get this in your heart. That until our hearts, men, are right with God. Until God confronts us. Until God purifies us, we will never be able to lead people. We will never be able to lead our families. We will never be able to be the example to children in our homes or out in the streets. We will never be effective until God confronts you for what's inside of you. You've got to allow God to purge you so that he can now use. Are y'all following what I'm saying? Notice, he's in the wine. He's out there. He, he's doing what uh, he, he he's doing work for his father. He's working, minding his own business. But God calls him. <laughs> God calls him, and then God calls him a mighty man of war, a valor. Now he's confronted with the justice of God. I'm going to show you where he where the justice of God comes in at. Drop. Look at verse 13. Now notice the confrontation. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, The Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. Then Gideon said to him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord is with to us. His thinking, I told you God has to confront us. He has to confront our thinking. He has to change our thought pattern. He is confronted with God and God's justice. Now notice, God has to, has to correct his understanding of God's justice. He's thinking the way Israel is thinking. Who is going to go up before us? And who is going to fight the Canaanites? And here Gideon is saying, wait a minute. If the Lord is really with us and for us, then why has he forsaken us? What Gideon didn't understand was that it wasn't God that had forsaken Israel. It was Israel who had forsaken God. As a matter of fact, later on in the chapter, God is going to command Gideon to destroy all of the idols that are in his father's house. Which presupposes that not only his, his parents and his siblings were idol worshippers, perhaps he was as well. God has to confront him to change his thinking about the justice of God. And although we see injustices going on, although we see that God has not made all of the wrongs right yet and God has, has patiently waited on man to come to their senses, it doesn't mean that God has gone to sleep on things. It doesn't mean that God still expects us as men to rise up to the calling of making things right. It, it, what it shows, God has to confront us as men to change our thinking about his justice. And not only that, church, God had to change Gideon's thinking about himself. Because here, Gideon plays the blame game. Notice, he says, if God is really for us, I'm looking at our situation right now, and our situation isn't good. But what Gideon did not acknowledge was that their, their, their problem, their predicament, was, a, was the outpouring of their own doing. And Gideon had to take responsibility also along with Israel for where they were. 
Men, I'm going to tell you something. If we're going to be mighty men of valor, if we're going to be the, the, the number of a few good men that God can use, then we're going to have to take responsibility of the predicament that we sometimes put ourselves in, sometimes put our families in. We're going to have to take responsibility. We're going to have to take ownership of why things are the way they are, we be at home or in our community, we are in the church. We're going to have to take responsibility, own up to our own deficiencies, own up to our lack of involvement, own up to our lack of of, of, of being transparent with our young people, and say that it is not God's fault, but it is our fault. The justice of God. He's confronted with the justice of God. And it's a bad thinking. He's thinking it's God that has forsaken us. No. No. Quite the opposite. They had forsaken God. He's confronted. He's confronted, church, with the justice of God. Which means we will never solve our problems until we face our person. Until we face the man in the mirror. Now notice, Gideon says, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about? Saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? Now watch him. But now the Lord has abandoned us and has given us into the hands of, the, of Midian. So now... He says, wait a minute. Now he must be confronted with the power of God. His, his thinking is that because God's justice has not gone forth to deliver Israel, that something must be wrong with God's power. Well, the problem is he confused God's patience with, uh, with the absence of God's power. Or he equated God's patience and God's slowness to justice to being a deficiency in God's power. He says, and notice what he said. Well, what, did, what, what happened to this God that our fathers told us about? The, the God that showed all of this great power that they, they, they would often brag about. Who delivered them out of the hands of Egypt, the Egyptians. Where is this power? And let me tell you something, fellas. If you don't ever become confronted with God, confronted with God's justice, confronted with God's power, you will never allow God's power to work in you and through you. If all you see is what you see, you will never understand that God's power is greater than you, greater than your circumstances, greater than your past, and God is trying to use his power to bring about a few good men to make change and difference in the world. So don't confuse God's slowness to justice with being insufficient and deficient in his power. Now, he concluded that if God wasn't willing, then God wasn't able. And, and church, that not, this isn't just for men. You gotta understand that. When, when, if just because God may not be willing to deliver you, or God may not be willing to bring about justice at that time, doesn't mean that God isn't able. you got to know God is able in spite of men. God is able in spite of wickedness. And, you, and sometimes it would do us good, all of us, to do a self-check to recognize why God may not be willing. Sometimes, church, it's because of sin in our lives. It's because of uh, of, of unbelief in our hearts that may compel God to withhold blessings from us, to withhold deliverance, and we get we go away thinking God may not necessarily be able. But no, see, confrontation with God brings this about. Confrontation with God will change your understanding of his justice. It'll change your understanding of his power. And it's going, to, it's going to change your understanding of God's faithfulness. Notice, he says, had, 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 this God has abandoned us. This God that you all claim is so powerful. This God that wrought all of these miracles against Pharaoh and the Egyptians. He said, where is this God now? Where is
has this God and his power being demonstrated now? We are in bondage. It seems to me, this is Gideon, it seems to me God has forsaken us. But what he failed, what God had to change was his understanding of God's faithfulness. You see, God had not forsaken them, church. And you need to get this, I want you to get this. Before God could deliver Israel, God had to deliver Gideon from himself. Yeah, before, and, and that's what you, before God can deliver you, before God brings about blessings in your life, God has to deliver you from you. Because oftentimes we are our worst enemies. Oftentimes we are a detriment to ourselves. Oftentimes we can't ever help anybody else because we can't get ourselves right. And God is saying, if I'm going to use a few good men, then I've got, before I can use you to deliver other people, I need to deliver you from yourself. The greatest enemy is self. And he had to help Gideon. He says, my faithfulness had gone anywhere. My love for my people hadn't diminished at all. The problem is, Gideon, my people have lost love and a taste for me. They have lost an affinity for me. They, they, have, they have disregarded my goodness, and they've actually given credit to the idol. He says, so my faithfulness is still here. My faithfulness won't go anywhere. My faithfulness is eternal, and my power is eternal. My justice is eternal. And when I get ready to act, I'm going to use a few good men. But you've got to be confronted with my justice, my power, and my faithfulness. And then, church, his men, fellas, here's what I want you to also get. Our own life must be true to God before we can be of service to God. Let me say that again. Our life, our own life, must be true to God before we can be of any service to God. Are y'all hearing that? If God is going to use a few good men, it has got to be a few good men whose lives are being true to God in order for God to put you in service to God. Yeah, that's all in the confrontation, church. God calls him, he's in the wine press. God is calling all men today, whatever your wine press may be, God is calling men to be men. I know that the world has redefined manhood. I know that this transgenderism has, has convoluted and homosexuality has convoluted the idea, the God-given, ordained understanding and picture of manhood. I understand that. We are all in our own wine prayer. I know that the Me Too movement is making a, 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 a wreaking havoc on manhood. I know that we've got the, the old adage, whatever men can do, we can do better. I get all of that, but however, what manhood is seen by in the sight of God does not change. And whatever wine press you are in, I need you to understand, God is still calling men to be men. God is still looking for a few good men. God is needing men to be confronted with his justice, his power, and his faithfulness. God wants men whose lives are being true to him so that he can use them to be of service in his kingdom. And then we come to the commission of God. And we've got the call. We've got the call of God. Now we're going to look at the call, the commission of God. Now watch this. Gideon gives, he gives this warped understanding of God, right? He believes God has abandoned him. He believes that God isn't with him. He failed to acknowledge and own up to not only his sin, but Israel's sin as well. Now, the text says in verse 14, the text says, the Lord looked at him and said, church, now hear me, Gideon, is fault finding. He's pushing blame on God and not himself. He's looking at his problem and not the problem solved. And in spite of all that, God understands.
understands it. God is gentle with him because God has called him. God is trying to change his thinking so that when he's ready, he can use him effectively. But notice just the power in verse 14. The Bible says the Lord looked at him. Now the Lord knew where he was. He finds him in the wine press. But then the text says, and the Lord looked at him. Church, I'm so glad that in spite of my shortcomings, in spite of all that I, the things that I have failed to do and failed to accomplish, God looked at me. And he saw more in me than I saw in myself. I'm thankful that there are men who understand that whatever society may say about you, whatever your communities may say about you, whatever your families may say about you, God looked at you. And he saw more in you than you ever saw in yourself. God looked at him and notice what God says to him. Go in this your strength. <laughs> That's the commission, church. Now, no, <laughs> God makes this commission personal. He says, go. God looked at it. That's personable, church. God, God could have gotten any other Israelite to, to go and deliver Israel. There were, there were thousands of other men that God could have used. But what did God do? He goes to the wine press and then he, and then he picks out Gideon. The Bible says he looked at him and he says, now you go. And that's the other thing, brothers, you got to understand. When God has called you, when God has commissioned you after you've been confronted with God, then you can't confuse your calling and your commission with other people's commission. So often we as men, we look at other men and we try to determine how God is going to use us based on what we see in the lives of other people. No, what you've got to understand God is looking at you. God is looking for a few good men. And he's looking at individual after individual. And he's saying, who can I raise up now? I need you, Gideon, to go. Look at the commission. God, and, and, and then God says to him. Now, don't forget what God had said to him in verse, uh, in verse uh, 12. He says, you are a mighty man of valor. Now, church, this might not mean much to you until you read verse, right around verse 15 when you look, when you start to see how Gideon saw himself. Now, what God says about Gideon, it, it doesn't bring about much power until you see how Gideon saw himself. God commissioned him. He says, I need you to go. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. There are other mighty men who are warriors in, in, your, in your kingdom, God. There are mighty Israelites, men who have been trained to fight, men who have been trained in combat. And you go to the wine press to pull out old Gideon, and then you call him a mighty man of valor? Oh, oh, oh watch this, church. Oh, God saw in him. Now, we got that. God saw in him what Gideon couldn't see in himself. Uh-huh. He was a mere, he, he, was, he, was, he was a man who was obscure. Who knew about Gideon? No one really cared about Gideon. He's out there tending in the farm to his father's wine press. He wasn't a man of fame. He wasn't a man of stature. He, matter of fact, the Bible doesn't say anything about his good looks. It doesn't say, it say anything about his prowess. It doesn't say anything about how powerful and strong he was, how, how adept and able he was, and skilled in fighting and combat. The Bible doesn't say anything about that. It says he was in the wine press. And God looked at him and called him a mighty man of valor. And God says, you are who I'm going to use. What, what's the point? Here's the point. It was not in himself that made him valid. valid. It was the God who would, it was what God would make out of him that made him valid. Church, now let me say that again, brothers. It wasn't what Gideon saw him in himself that made him valid. It was what God was going to make out of him that made
made him valid. And church, I believe that's a word for some of these brothers today that you know, I know that you have some shortcomings, you have some hiccups, you have some failures, but it ain't necessarily about what you see in yourself or what you are unable and incapable of doing. It ain't about none of that. What's in it, what it's all about is what God has the power to make out of you, and that's a mighty man of value. Sure, and, 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 and you may, you may not have finished school, but God can still say you are a mighty man of valor. You, you may have, you may have given, you may have had, you, you got children all over the place. That as long as you have breath in your body, God can still use you and make you a mighty man of valor. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying, church? So often we condemn men and we beat up men, and even in their failures and their shortcomings and, and their, and their hang-ups. And God is still saying, but I'm looking for a few good men. And sometimes, church, they're right around us. But we just do more beating them down and stifling their growth. Hmm? That, that, that they, don't, they don't participate at all. Do you not know Liberty City? This church, I'm not talking about other churches. Do you not know Liberty City is made up of 75% women? I, you don't have to take my word for it. When we get back in the building, look around and you'll see who, who's in here to worship. It's made up of the majority women. Where are the men? Where are these men of valor? It only takes a few. God is looking to raise up mighty men. And I'm thankful because what we're going to see here, church, and brothers, I want you to hear me. You do not have to have a Bible degree in order to be a mighty man of valor. You don't have to have gone to Princeton or Yale in order to be a mighty man of valor. Are y'all hearing me, church? Brothers, hear me. God can use you right where you are if you allow him. You've got to allow him to. And that's the thing. It was not in himself that made him valid, but it was what God was going to make out of him. Mm -hmm. Don't confuse your call and your commission with others. Stop looking at other men. Stop looking at other people and focus on what God is trying to do through you and in you. All right? And then, and then I want us to notice the priority of the commission. The priority to, of the commission, God says, go. It's emphatic. He says, listen, I've spotted you. I've got my man. Now go. Now notice, that's the priority in the commission. Now, the priority in the commission is seen in, in, in terms of who is the communicator of the commission, which means the one who is the communicator of the commission has more authority uh, in the commission. So it's God who is giving him the commission to go. And because it is God who has the authority, uh, Gideon does not have a choice. God has called him, God has commissioned him, and now the priority in the commission is connected to the one who has the authority in the commission. That's almighty God. I need to tell you, brothers, when God commissions us, when God calls us, we don't have a choice. This is not a suggestion. You don't have a, a time to play around and to, and, to, and to do other things other than what God has called. Priority in this commission is because God is the authoritative figure in the commission. And he wants all men to rise up and go. Go and get those wayward children. Go and, go and bring, uh, bring a difference to young people with no father. Go in there and make a difference to those strung out on drugs at a young age. Church, I remember I went to, for the first time, I, was, I went, I visited New Orleans. I went to New Orleans and as we were walking around, I noticed on the park all of these young people. And come to find out, church, 
Many of them were strung out. Many of them were homeless. They had run away from home. Out in Louisiana, out in New Orleans, living on the park, they had all they some of them had had, had carts and, and, and buggies with their clothes in it, backpacks, living on the park, living on the streets. Church, they need us. And, and, and that's not that's not far fetched. Right here in Savannah, right there in various cities in Georgia, there are young people who've run away, strayed away, they're going their own way trying to find their own way, and we need men. God is looking for a few good men. A few good men to make a difference. Well, well, the priority in the commission is seen in the one who has authority in the commission. There is no higher authority than God. All right? And then the rank of the one who gives the commission dictates Dictates the priority, right? Now, God says to him, go. Now we're going to see. So what we have, we have the personal, personal boldness in the commission. He says, the Bible says God looked at him, at him. Then we see the power. I mean, the priority in the commission, right? It's God who gives the commission. And then we, now we're going to see the power uh -huh, in the commission. He says, go. In this might. Watch it. Let's, let's read the text. In the text. The Lord looked at him and said, Go in this your strength and deliver Israel from the hands of Midian. Well, now, wait a minute. He's in the wine press. He doesn't even believe that he is capable of, of, of actually bringing about such a victory. But, the, but what he needed to understand was the power in the commission. God wasn't just sending him. God just wasn't sending a, 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 a wine presser. God was sending him in his strength, in divine strength. And fellas, let me tell you, you've got to understand when God calls you, when you are confronted with God, when God has commissioned you, God will send you to, do, uh, uh, to accomplish things that are greater than you. And he wants you to know that it wasn't never about you all along. It was all about the power, might, and strength of Almighty God working in your life. The power of the commission. He said, now notice. Here's the power. He says, go in this your strength. Deliver Israel from the hand of Midian. Then he says, have I not sent you? <laughs> That's power, church. That's power in the commission. He says, go in this your strength. Well, what's your strength? Not Gideon's strength, my strength. Well, how, what's the confirmation of it, God? I sent you. And when God sends you, when God sends a man, God will never leave him uh, uh, diminished. He will never leave him incapable. God will, uh, will empower him to do great things, things that are always, always, always bigger than himself. And fellas, if you don't see the calling bigger than yourself, then all you'll end up doing is being inclusive and selfish. God said, no, this, get it, this thing is bigger than you. I know it's bigger than you. That's why I'm sending you. I know it's greater than your abilities. That's why you have to rely on my ability. I know you are without strength and power. That's why you must depend on my strength and power. I know you aren't wise enough, may not have been trained in, in combat, but I'm going to be your warrior. I'm going to fight this battle, but I need a few good men to make it come about. Watch it, church. Watch it. So here's the, the, now that's the power of the commission, right? Now notice, notice verse 15. He says, oh Lord, how, how shall I deliver Israel? He says, behold, my family is the least of Manasseh. Manasseh. He says, I, I am the youngest in my father's house. Now God has just told him, you are a mighty man of valor. I have put my eye, my hand on you. I have chosen you. You will go in my strength. 
You will go because I sent you. And now he comes about and he says, wait a minute. Father, Lord, what you don't know is, is that I am not. Look at this. He says, I am the least even in my family. Boy, this is powerful, church. Because, because brothers, I want you to know that, that we, there are some fellows who even in your own family, they may not have thought much about you. Even in your own uh, uh, community, they may not have, have seen well, much coming out of you. Just like Gideon. Gideon says, wait a minute, I'm the least in my family. And then he says, and then he says, and I am the youngest in my father's house. Let me hear me, fellas. It isn't about how old you are. God can use you at whatever age you he wants to. About how famous you are. It doesn't matter how great you are in your family. God isn't concerned with fame. God is concerned with faith. And Gideon is saying, Lord, I'm the least in my family. How many men listening to me right now feel like you are the least in your family right now? God says that, yeah, but I ain't worried about fame. Hmm? I'm not worried about your own personal ability. He said, what I need from you is faith. Look at that. Look at that, church. He, he said, I'm, I, I, I'm the least. I'm the youngest in my father's house. But the Lord said to him, I will be with you. God disregarded all of that. A father, look, how am I able to deliver Israel? I got a problem here. I, I, I'm not the one that's called, that, that's really ready to deliver Israel. As a matter of fact, I'm the least in my family. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, I'm the youngest in my family. Go get one of my older brothers. And how often do we as men, even in the church, we pass the buck off on other people instead of taking the responsibility ourselves? God is trying to tell him, Gideon, just like he's telling you today, I will be with you. It was I who sent you. It's me who called you. It's me you must have a confrontation with to change your heart. It's me that's commissioned you to go. Look at that. Yeah, and then that's the promise. Now, so here's what we got. We got the commission of God. In the commission of God, we see the personal bonus of God, right? He looks upon Gideon. And then we see the priority of the commission. Right? He go because it's the, uh, the uh, one who is in authority, who has supreme authority, has commissioned him to go. And then we see the power in the commission. He says, go in this my strength. Right? And now we see the promise in the commission. The promise is, I will be with you. Can't you see that same, that's the same promise that God, Jesus gave the disciples concerning the great commission. He says, after he tells them to go in all the world and make disciples, he says, and lo, and by the way, I'll be with you even unto to the ends of the earth, ages of the earth. Matter of fact, that's fruit and food for us to feed on today, brothers. Because when you feel inadequate, God is still late. When you feel helpless, God still gives hope. When you feel like throwing in the towel and giving up, God still gives us victory. And what he wants us as men to know, no matter what you face in life, no matter where you have been in life, no matter what you have been going through or are that we have been through, going, been in and gone through, no matter what you're going through right now, I will be with you. And when you as a man understand, when you are confronted with God and you recognize and you believe God is with you, you can accomplish anything. You can accomplish great things for God. But you got to believe it. You've got to believe it. He says, now, notice the promise. Now watch the promise, church. He said, I will be with you. Now watch the promise. You shall defeat many. <laughs> uh, and then he says, as one man. Look at that, church. Now he's showing them. He said, it will be as if you brought about this victory. He said, but no, you're going to need some help. 
I'm going to get you some help. And that's why we're going to continue this series, this, this little mini series. He said, I'm going to get you some help. But you will be so great in the eyes of others because of my power that it will be like you defeated Midian by yourself as one man. The strength. That's the promise. I'll be with you. You will defeat Midian. He didn't say it's a possibility. And fellas, you got to believe that when God is with you, everything is possible. Every and anything brings about a possibility with God. You can accomplish anything with God. You can overcome anything with God. He says, I'll be with you. You will defeat Midian. And I want to encourage your brother today that whatever Midians are in your life, God, through God's power working in you, you can defeat whatever Midian is in your life right now. You can defeat him. I said you can defeat him. There isn't a possibility. There isn't a maybes. No, no, no. You will. God tells Gideon, you will defeat Midian. So Gideon said to him, now if I found favor in your sight, show me a sign that it is you who speak with me. Please do not depart from here until I go back to you and bring out my offering and lay it before you. He said, I will remain until you return. Then Gideon went in and prepared a young goat and unleavened bread and an ephah of flour and he poured the meat in the basket and broth in a pot, brought it out to him and un under the oak and presented them. Then the angel of the Lord said to him, take the meat and unleavened bread, lay it upon the rock, pour out on the broth, and he did so. Then the angel of the Lord said, put out the end of the staff that was in his hand, touch the meat and the, meat and the unleavened bread, and the fire sprang up from the rock and consumed the meat and unleavened bread. Then the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. And when Gideon saw that it was the angel of the Lord, he said, alas, God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. The Lord said to him, peace. To you, do not fear, for you will not die. Then Gideon built the altar, altar to the Lord, named it, the Lord is peace. Now, we've got the call of Gideon. And within that call, there was a confrontation of God. And then we've got the commission of God. And within that commission, we've got the, prior, the personableness of God, the, of the commission, the priority in the commission, power in the commission, promise in the commission. Now we get to the confirmation of Gideon. Watch this. Gideon says to, to the Lord or to the angel of the Lord he says to him, wait here, let me go and offer up sacrifice. So fellas if you want confirmation that God is with you if you want confirmation that God is calling you or has called you, here's how you get confirmation. Two simple things that Gideon did. He sacrificed to the Lord and he submitted to the Lord. He said, let me go and offer, I'm going to bring back a meal for you. I'm going to sacrifice and I'm going to submit myself. See, this is, this is confirmation of covenant. God says, okay, I'll wait. And Gideon goes, he prepares the meal. He sacrifices the animal. He, put, he, he cooks it, prepares the meal. He brings the offering back to God for confirmation. So what am I saying to you, brothers? If you want to know whether or not God is giving confirmation on your life to lead and to, and to rise up and do great things, then here's what's contingent on the confirmation. Sacrifice and submission. I believe the Bible says in Romans chapter 12, I beg you, brother, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable worship, which means, church, when we submit to God, we can't help but sacrifice to God. If you are unwilling to submit to God, you will also be unwilling to sacrifice to, to God. When we brothers 
get on the same page of submission and sacrifice to God, it will be at that point we see that God has confirmed our calling. God is looking for a few good men. He's looking for some men that he can confirm his calling in them. Looking for a few good men who aren't afraid of being confronted by God. Looking for a few good men who will take on the commission of God. He's looking for a few good men. What are, what, what, what are we saying here today? That if you are not a child of God, my brother God is commissioned. He's, he's, he's given a commission. But he's calling you most importantly. He's calling you to be in his kingdom. He's calling you to come to him by faith. To repent of your sins and be immersed into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. He's calling you. Second Thessalonians 2.14 says God calls us by his gospel. He is calling men today. And if you are not a child of God, he's calling you. Yes, he is. And, and here's the other thing. He has, and when he calls you, it presupposes he's given a commission for you. You want, you want to know what your purpose is? To glorify God. Oftentimes people are asked that question, well, what is my purpose in life? Glorify God, to give God glory in your life. Well, here's the thing, brother. He is calling you to give him glory. That's a commission. That's a commission. But you got to be willing to be confronted with God. His justice, his power, and his faithfulness. Know that God's justice will reign true. God will deliver his people. And know that there isn't anything wrong with God's power simply because he delays his justice. And then know that God is faithful. The fact that this world still exists as it is right now means God is still faithful to his promise. Still faithful to his character. But he's calling you. He's calling us as men. He just needs a few good ones. All church, we're going to continue this lesson. We're going to look, we're going to look at chapter 7. And we're going to look and see what happens when God rounds up a few good men. I pray that this lesson has been a blessing to you. I pray, brothers, that you have been enriched and empowered to rise up to the calling of God and the commission of God. I pray that you have been empowered and you want to do more for the cause of Christ. I pray that you want to be a mighty man of valor. I want to be near the cross, near the cross. I want to be near, near the cross, the cross where Jesus died, where he died. The cross where I receive my sight. I want to be near the cross, and I want to hold his hands, hold his hands. I
and that we will, our hearts will always and forever be confronted with you so that our hearts will be purged and cleansed, purified, so that we will be of service to you. Father, we pray and ask that you, uh, you forgive us of our sins. For those who may be derelict in their duties as fathers, forgive us, Father. Have mercy on us and pick us up, Father, where we have shortcomings. Father, we pray and ask that you will bless us and empower us to give you glory in our lives, that we will somehow be an influence and inspiration to other young men around the world, and even young women around this, the world. Father, we pray and ask for those on our prayer list that you bless them according to their need. Give them, Father, what they need, and may they always be careful to glorify your name and give honor and praise to your son. Father, we ask all of these many blessings. We say thank you. We love you and adore you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My dear brothers, go in peace. Know that God has called you a mighty man of valor. My sisters, encourage our brothers. Build them up. Strengthen them. Give them, give them the encouragement that they need. We all need it. So that we will, we will take on and believe and put in our spirit that we are mighty men of valor. I love you. So I love to praise him. I love to praise him.